Hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, this third webinar of our Cancer Survivor to Financial Survivor webinar series. My name is Yeshua, and I will be facilitating this webinar series for the Canadian Cancer Survivor Network. On behalf of CCSN, I'd just like to thank you for attending today's webinar, which is uh, the second of two webinars on disability benefits, this one entitled The Disability Test. Uh, as you may know, CCSN is no stranger to webinars for our um, network of patients, caregivers, and survivors. And the objective of this series in particular is to provide information and resources to help improve the financial situation experienced by cancer patients, caregivers, and their families as they navigate life with and after cancer. So if you'd like to learn more about CCSN, please visit our website at www.survivornet.ca. You'll find plenty of information there on us, as well as news, events, and other resources that we think you'll find helpful. Uh, two very quick announcements before I hand things off to our presenter for tonight. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, and it will be available shortly uh, on YouTube, and the video link will be sent to the email you provided when registering for the uh, webinar. And this, uh, this slides will also be available on SlideShare. That link will also be provided as a follow-up. That way you can go back and, and share this resource uh, or go back and watch it later if you'd like. Uh, at the end of the presentation, we'll have a short Q&A session. However, don't feel the need to wait until the end. Uh, please feel free to type your questions into the window at the bottom right of your screen so we can have them queued up. And um, yeah, so so if you, as questions come up, feel free to pop them in and we see them here. I'll, I'll pass them on to Daniel. With that said, CCSN is pleased to welcome our presenter for tonight, Daniel Bastine, um, and he will share about himself and uh, what he's talking to us today about. Hi, thanks, Yeshua. Uh, yeah, so I'm Daniel Bastian. I'm a paralegal and community legal worker over at Neighborhood Legal Services, where um, a legal aid funded community legal clinic. Um, yeah, and I specialize in uh, work around social assistance. So mostly work with Ontario Works and the Ontario Disability Support Program. A lot of what I do is helping people who are denied ODSP onto the program. So just a little uh, disclaimer. So all information in this presentation is general information and not advice specific to any particular situation. Uh, so the information in this presentation should not be take should not be relied upon to make legal decisions, uh, and I recommend you get independent legal advice for any specific legal problems. One second, just scooch a control panel out of my window so I can see what I'm reading. Great. And so, what is Neighborhood Legal Services? So we're a free, non-for-profit, and independent community legal clinic that's been serving. Toronto's downtown east since 1973. Um, and just a little quick spiel on the legal aid clinics. Um, all of Ontario is covered by uh, community legal clinics. So every region has like a geographic clinic and they give free legal services for low income people. Uh, they typically do work around uh, tenant side, landlord's tenant law, um, social assistance, um, often they do immigration uh, or employment law, and sometimes they have some other like peculiar uh, specialties. Uh, and there's also a network of provincial specialty legal clinics that serve specific ethnocultural groups or have like particular legal focuses. Um, so yeah, they're just a great resource if you have um, legal problems and are of low income. So first, uh, what is ODSP? Uh, and I think this information today might be a bit, uh, rep some of it might be repetitive from what you heard last week from my uh, friend Jillian. Um, I think she touched on some aspects of ODSP. Um, I'll be focusing more on what's the legal test for getting on and like what counts as being disabled for ODSP purposes. Um, but uh, yeah, in brief, it's a provincial income support program. It's run by the uh, Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services. Uh, and it's for people who meet the program's definition of disability 
and meet the financial requirements. I believe you guys talked about the financial requirements last week, so I'll just really briefly touch on those. And you may have heard this last week, but everyone always wants to know how much does ODSP pay? Um, there is a really handy chart here. Um, so it's maybe not the most straightforward. So the top is for Ontario Works. You're not looking at that, you're looking at the bottom half of ODSP and you're looking in the bottom right corner, that's light blue. It's uh, a mix of different benefits. So you have the basic needs allowance, uh, which is under basic needs. You have the shelter allowance, which can only be used for rent. Um, and that is like, there's the maximums there. So if your rent is somehow less than these numbers, you get, you don't get the full amount. Um, and yeah, and OCB, that's the Ontario child benefit, which is sort of a separate thing. Um, and it really depends on if you're single, a couple, if there are kids in the mix. Um, the numbers are different if there are more than two children. But uh, this gives you a rough idea. But yeah, it's not a huge amount of money. So, um, some general information on where to find the rules that apply to ODSP. So, in case there are any legal beagles out there, uh, you can look at the Ontario Disability Support Program Act 1997. So that's the law that creates the ODSP and has a whole lot of the rules. Uh, you can also look at the general regulation. Uh, it's pretty technical legal stuff. Or you can just go straight to the ODSP policy directives. And they um, there's 87 of them. And they kind of explain all of the rules in practice in much more accessible language. So if you ever have any ODSP questions, you can literally just Google ODSP policy directive and like throw out some keywords like income or appeal and it'll probably come up. So how do you apply for ODSP? Um, so um, it has to, you have to have an approved health professional complete the application. Um, the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services um, pays for completion of the application. So they pay the doctor or nurse or whatever, like to fill out the form. You don't have to do that normally. Um, but if you have to pay for reports or whatever from your doctor, um, that's on you. Um, so, and typically, uh, once you get the application, you have 90 days to complete it and submit it, but you can, all, you can ask for extensions. And really, if you blow past the deadline and they, for some reason, don't give an extension, whatever, just ask for a new one, it's fine. Uh, just reapply with a new one. Oops. Uh, and typically, if you're if you want to get on ODSP, there's two ways to go about it. Uh, one way is if you're already on Ontario Works, um, then you would ask your Ontario Works caseworker for the ODSP application. Um, and there is part of the same ministry as as ODSP, so it's a bit I don't want to say seamless, but they're they're coordinated. Um, or if you're not on Ontario Works, you can also just apply straight to ODSP. Um, and you just basically go to your local office and ask them or call the Disability Adjudication Unit. Um, yeah. I also want to say that I think Jillian talked last week about financial requirements uh, and financial eligibility for, for Ontario Works and ODSP. Um, so you may recall that there's a much lower asset limit that's allowed uh, under Ontario Works than ODSP. Um, so you might think, I have $30,000 in assets. I'm too rich for Ontario Works, but not too rich for ODSP. Um, if you're in that situation, you can tell Ontario Works that your intention is to apply for ODSP and they can temporarily change the asset limit for you. Um, so even though you may be too rich for Ontario Works, you can temporarily be on it and get some income while you get your ODSP application going. 
Okay, so here's some uh, other stuff. So uh, in some cases, uh, the ODSP application gets denied for whatever reason. Um, and I, I'm sure a lot of people have heard stories uh, of ODSP super hard to get on. They always refuse you uh, the first time around. Um, so what a lot of people don't realize is you can challenge that. Um, so after your ODSP is denied, you have 30 days to file what's called an internal review request. Um, they send you a letter that explains this, and they tell you like where to send the letter. Uh, but basically, you can just get a form from the website or just write a letter that says that, you know, this is who I am. Uh, my application was denied. Um, I request an internal review of the decision. And that's, you basically ask ODSP to change their own mind. Um, and if you have some extra medical information, you can include that. Um, and they may, if there's extra information, they may reverse their decision at that point. They often don't. Um, but then if you file the request for interim review, you can then do what's called file an appeal, which then takes it out of ODSP's hands and puts it in the hands of the Social Benefits Tribunal. And like more than 50% of people who go there get put on ODSP by the tribunal. So they, they do overturn a lot of ODSP's refusals. So the main takeaway is if you're, you apply for ODSP and get denied, don't get discouraged. Just do what the letter says and challenge the decision. And there's a good chance that you can win. Uh, at this stage, I definitely recommend contacting a legal aid clinic um, for help. This is a lot of what we do. Uh, and if you're, yeah, basically in a position where you qualify for ODSP, you probably qualify for our services financially. Um, yeah. Oh, and if you get your application denied and eventually get put on later by the tribunal, uh, they pay you the retroactive amount that you're entitled to. So it can be a, a big chunk of money if it was a, a lengthy process. Okay, so here are some hot tips for applying for ODSP. Um, you should tell, you know what, I'm gonna go back to that. First, I'm going to talk about what's the definition of disability. Because um, that kind of, you need to understand that part um, before the hot tips make sense. So that was a formatting error on my part, my apologies. So uh, per the ODSP Act 1997, um, ODSP has a very specific definition of disability that I think nobody, else uses their specific definition. Uh, you know, CPP disability has a different definition. Everyone else has a different definition. So the ODSP version is very particular. So it's a multi-step test. So first you have to have what's called substantial physical or mental impairments that are continuous or recurrent and expected to last one year or more. So impairment, that's the main word there, that means symptoms. And substantial, that means legally it's less than severe, but still significant. Um, and yeah, so it can be continuous or current, it can be physical or mental, um, and it, this part is super important, and I expect it would be particularly important for like cancer survivors uh, who are in treatment. Um, the expected to last one year or more. Um, that part is super key. It's literally a box that the doctor has to tick off in the application. And if they don't tick the box that it's expected to last one year or more, ODSP is just like, doesn't count, we don't care. Um, and often, you know, people's doctors may be super optimistic and maybe saying like, no, nah, like, it'll be good. Like all this stuff, it's, I think it might be done in less than a year. Like if we do all the right things and whatever, which is super for like a healthcare professional doing healthcare stuff, but for getting you on ODSP, it's just like terrible, <laughs> terrible. Uh, it's guaranteed failure. 
So um, if you have a doctor who's doing this, uh, make sure they understand that it has to be one year or more or you don't get on ODSP. Okay, so that's the first step of the test. The second step is that the direct and cumulative effect of the impairments on the person's ability to function to his or her personal care, function in the community, and function in the workplace results in a substantial restriction in one or more of these activities of daily living. Uh, I, I'm going to rephrase that in more clear language. So once you have physical or mental impairments that are substantial and expected to last one year or more, they have to then lead to what's called substantial restrictions in your ability to take care of yourself, your ability to function in the community, or your, or your ability to function in a workplace. Um, and you only have to prove one of the three um, to qualify, though I always recommend going for as many as you can to maximize your chances. Um, and I'm going to also, this is where the substantial word is super important as being less than severe. Um, so like legally severe, and which and severe is the language that CPP disability uses. Like you have to be like severely disabled to get on CPP disability. Severe, it basically means um, like it's like very very serious. Um, and like if you were say severely restricted from functioning in a workplace, that means you basically cannot work. Like that's what a severe restriction would look like. That is not the legal test for ODSP. It's substantial is less than that. So it's easier to get on ODSP than CPP disability for this reason. Um, so you can be substantially restricted from your ability to function in a workplace, but still be able to work part time. Like if you're, you know, sick and have substantial impairments and they stop you from being able to work full time, but you can handle like a shift a week or two shifts a week or, you know, whatever, like that can, you can still get on ODSP. Um, and I'm really harping on this point uh, because a lot of people's understanding is that you have to be unable to work to qualify for ODSP. Um, so I'm just really hammering on the point that that is not the legal test. You can be able to work and still be disabled enough to get on ODSP. Um, yes. Moving along. And then the third part of the test is that, uh, yeah, and this should also be expected to last one year or more. Um, the impairment and their, its likely duration and the restriction in the person's activities of daily living have to have been verified by a person with a prescribed qualifications. Um, and that part's important when you fill out the form because I think we'll get to that later, but there's a part that you can fill out if you want to, the self-report, and there's a part that the doctor or nurse or who, healthcare professional fills out. If you put down a bunch of symptoms and restrictions, you're probably not a person with the prescribed qualifications, so it doesn't meet the legal test. Um, if your doctor puts the same things, it can meet the legal test of being verified by a person with prescribed qualifications. So I just want people to understand that if you do apply for ODSP and you write some stuff down, but then the doctor doesn't write those things down also, the things that you write um, may not get considered. Um, so here's some hot, hot tips. So, yes, patients should tell their healthcare providers about all of their impairments and restrictions. Um, I, I definitely see issues where patients really briefly talk to their doctor and their doctor put like a couple of little things. Um, they get denied, they come to me and then we talk and then it turns out there's a whole whack of symptoms and restrictions and like ways that the disability affects their day-to-day -day living that their doctor didn't, was not aware of. 
then we have to go back and ask them to fix it. Um, so you can save yourself the hassle and make sure that you tell them about all of your symptoms and restrictions. Um, also, there are some charts in there uh, where they tick, you know, one, two, three, or four for if different activities of daily living or um, like mental health symptoms are serious or not. Um, it's called the ADLI and IEWS charts. We're getting a bit into the weeds here. Um, but they should, the doctor should consult with you when they do that. Because uh, sometimes I just see doctors put a whole bunch of stuff that say, yeah, no problem. You can totally do this. But when you actually talk to the patient, no, they really can't do the thing. Like, you know, for example, they may say like, yes, you can totally do groceries. And the patient might be like, absolutely not. Like I can't walk to the store because like my knees are shot. Uh, I have like these crazy shoulder problems and I can't lift the bags. I need to have, I need help. People have to come with me to get my groceries. Um, then we have to go back and try to get the doctor to fix it. So definitely recommend having the doctor talk to you and, and for you to participate in the application process. Um, the next point, I already talked about this. Um, so what you put in the self-report does not count as being verified because you don't, you know, unless you're an approved health professional. So yeah, but you, should, if, you know, if you do fill it out, um, I would recommend showing it to your uh, healthcare professional so they know all that information when they fill it out, their, their portion. Uh, and there's debate whether people should complete it. There's different school, schools of thought. Some people say you should fill out the self-report because it helps, you know, the people deciding, you know, gets them to understand a bit more what your life is like and get a bit of context. Others say it's a bad idea because if you contradict something the doctor says, it might become an issue. Um, you know, I don't have a strong feeling either way, but I do recommend not contradicting what the doctor says. So maybe give things a look over. Okay, okay so this is the bit about um, the healthcare professionals and the pe people with the prescribed qualifications. So in general, people who are doctors, and this includes like, you know, psychiatrists and different kinds of doctors, and RNECs, so registered nurses extended class, uh, which is like nurse practitioners, uh, they can verify both impairments and restrictions. Um, social workers, like registered social workers with like the calls of social workers, they cannot verify impairments, like they're not doctors, they can't talk about symptoms, but they can verify restrictions and they can fill out the activities of daily living index. So just something to keep in mind, if you are you know, being helped by registered social workers, they can help complete the application. And they may actually have a lot more insight into your day-to-day -day restrictions than your doctor who maybe doesn't spend as much time talking to you. Um, oh yes, include uh, useful evidence of treatment and testing. They definitely, um, ODSP doesn't trust doctors, basically, to tell them the truth. Um, I don't know if I'm supposed to say that, but they don't. Um, they really like to see like objective evidence um, and like specialist reports. So um, yeah, definitely is whatever specialist reports that you have or like test results or anything like objective and like reporty, um, generally include it, unless it's like hurtful to your case, like if it says that this person is completely fine and is faking all of his symptoms, then maybe don't include that. But if it's like supports the argument that you're disabled, I would recommend including it. Um, oh yeah, and they also look at whether you need help doing stuff, you know, like basically the thinking is for ODSP, if you can do, you know, all this, if you can do the groceries and take care of the kids and take out the garbage and 
walk the dog and do all this stuff by yourself with no help, well, maybe you're not really that disabled. That's uh, their thinking. So anything that you need help with, um, make sure that's mentioned in the application. You know, there are different parts you can plug that information in. So if you, you know, need help with groceries or, you know, if people need to drive you around because you can't take public transit or you can't walk far, um, include that in the application. All right. This part. Okay. Uh, I think, yeah, so this is um, how to legally challenge ODSP decisions. So one of the big ones that we see is people's application being denied. We're not going to talk about the other ones. Um, and this is sort of what I already said. Um, so you get the letter, like your, your refusal letter. Um, you have 30 days to file a request for interim review. I recommend you do that. And also legal clinics can help with this. Uh, a lot of what we do is just file interim reviews and appeals for people. Um, but the, the, the decision letter does say how to do it. And, you know, a lot of people are able to do that themselves. Um, yeah, so this, we'll just skip this part. We'll skip. Yeah, so this is an important bit. So the interim review, it has to be in writing. You know, it can be a form, it can be um, a letter. But if you just call them up and say you disagree and you want an internal review, it doesn't count. Um, you, it has to be in writing. That's just part of the law. Yeah. And then, uh, as we we're saying earlier, after your internal review, you can appeal to the Social Benefits Tribunal. And the uh, Social Benefits Tribunal can overturn ODSP's decision. And yeah, you have 30 days to file the appeal from the date of the interim review decision. Or if you didn't get a decision back on the interim review, like sometimes it just gets lost in the shuffle um, or gets lost in the mail or whatever. Um, at that point, uh, you have 60 days from when the internal review was submitted to file the appeal. So, you know, maybe put that in your calendar uh, if you are internally reviewing an ODSP refusal so you don't miss the deadline. Uh, and if you're late, you can still file an appeal late, but you have to ask for an extension of time. Also with the internal review, you can technically also file it late, but you have to ask for an extension of time to form. But it's simpler if, you, if you're not late. And yeah, and the appeal forms can get them online. Like you can just Google like Social Benefits Tribunal appeal form. And they have a paid part of the website that's just forms. And so when that's called appeal form, form one, um, and you just fill it out. And yes. So this part is about uh, the appeals proper. So let's say you apply for ODSP, you did a great job or not, um, you get refused, did the internal review, you filed the appeal. Okay, at this point, uh, you can self-represent. A lot of people just represent themselves at the tribunal. Um, a lot of our clients um, honestly self-represent. It's like a very, you know, it's relatively informal as far as tribunals go, and they're really used to dealing with people with, you know, a lot going on in their lives, like disabilities and mental impairments. Um, so it's generally like, it's far as like legal processes go, like one of the more user-friendly ones out there. Um, and really for an ODSP refusal, you go and they basically ask you questions about, you know, your symptom, your impairments, your symptoms, how it affected your daily life. They ask a lot about your treatment and how that's going and how that went. Um, and then they make the decision based on what you say under oath and the documents that they have, um, whether you meet the legal test for disability. And like I said, um, in over 50% of appeals, people win and get put on ODSP. Um, Cause I didn't mention this, but up until this point, it's like entirely a paper process. Nobody from ODSP or their disability, disability adjudication unit ever really talks to you at all. Um, it's really just, they just look at what's on paper. 
So what your doctor filled out, what you wrote down, what reports you gave, that's all. At the tribunal, you can talk and explain to an actual human being. Um, and that's, so like they have, you know, the benefit of the additional evidence of your live testimony in legal speak. Um, and that's often what pushes it over the edge is client or the patient telling their story and explaining stuff. Um, but in some cases, like legal clinics um, can just like represent uh, at the hearing. We, we still want to be there because they're like the main witness. Um, for legal clinics, it really depends on a matrix of factors. So it depends on like the merit of the case, like the stakes of the case, you know, our own workload, the patient or the client's ability to self-represent, you know, if there's like some vulnerability or equity factors at play. Um, so it's like a sort of like a complex assessment that each clinic does differently, to be honest. Um, yeah. And yeah, and you can bring a support person to the hearing, but they must remain silent. Like, so if you, so like, you know, like not a legal representative, but like somebody can just be there just for moral support, but they really got it, like they cannot talk. Um, and if they do talk, they can get thrown out. And if they think, you know, if the tribunal board member thinks that the person is whispering the answers to you, that is extremely bad for your case. Uh, I've heard of that happening and like, you don't want that. But, you know, if your support person can be quiet, it, it can help still the, still the nerves. Um, yeah, and for medical appeals, basically um, all the evidence is due to be filed 30 days before the hearing to both ODSP's Disability, disability Adjudication Unit and the Tribunal 30 days before the hearing. Um, do I talk about, yeah. So I'm gonna talk a bit more, I don't have a slide on it, but what the hearings actually look like in practice. Um, it used to be like an in-person thing where, you know, you'd go to the tribunal place or they would come to you if you're in some remote location. That is pretty much done in the vast majority of cases since COVID. It's almost all either uh, video conferences, so like on Zoom um, or by telephone and increasingly Zoom. Um, by computer. Um, in some rare cases, they might give um, an in-person hearing if you have like a good argument for why you should get one. Um, I'm not aware of them giving it very often, but I have heard of some cases where it's successful. Um, but my general advice is expect them not to give you an in-person hearing. Uh, and yeah, that's... Yeah, oh yeah, and uh, timelines. It can be a bit of a lengthy process, eh? So uh, it can be like a year from the time that you uh, file your appeal to when your actual hearing date is. Um, in some cases, it's like less, like six to eight months, but that's generally the timeline you're looking at. Okay, so um, have some. I, I looked at the uh, case law um, and looked up uh, social benefits tribunal cases um, that were cancer related. Um, and I came up with like a list. It's like, it's super not a complete list, um, but this is just like some examples of cancer related uh, impairments and restrictions that people have used um, to get on ODSP and were successful. Um, so secondary depression and anxiety, because, you know, a lot of cancer patients and survivors are deal with these issues, um, that, you know, the, um, the legal test for an impairment is like, it can be physical or mental. So that can be used. Fatigue, uh, diffuse soft tissue pain. Uh, and like just generally like pain in general can be used for like ODSP, you know, as like a symptom. And then it's 
often leads to like, you know, mental health stuff, depression, um, concentration problems. Uh, fragile mood uh, was used in one, and that's sort of ties similar to the anxiety um, and depression one. Uh, treatment related cognitive impairment, right? So your treatment, if that has consequences on your ability to function, that can count. Uh, what, what I will also say is that like the doctor has to put that it's expected to last one year or more, or it's not going to count. Um, just repeating that, because uh, I think that could be an issue for cancer survivors if you have like a particularly, um, you know, optimistic doctor or like someone who's like has that kind of attitude, um, which is great in a doctor, but not good for getting on ODSP. So just reiterating, must be expected to last one year or more. And here are some cancer specific restrictions um, from the same batch of decisions I looked at. Uh, so difficulty concentrating can be one. Unable to do any work other than brief and light duties. Um, endurance, energy, inability to perform slash complete tasks, task switching, attention deficits, um, shoulder mobility. I think the shoulder mobility one was for one that had like breast cancer and I think had some kind of treatment that affected the shoulder. Yeah, so that's that. I'm gonna briefly, I'm just gonna check for time actually. Oh shoot, I'm gonna have to go faster. Um, so there's a bunch of people who are uh, what's called prescribed classes who can get on ODSP without having to go through the disability adjudication process. Um, a common one is CPP disability. Basically, if you can get on CPP disability, um, you're automatically considered eligible for ODSP for disability purposes. Um, and what often happens is people, like you get more money on CPPD than disability in many cases, or than ODSP, but then you can get the ODSP benefits in some cases, which I think are better than the CDP disability, which is why some people do that. Um, we're gonna skip the asset limits, but basically if you have more than $40,000 for a single person or more than $50,000 for a couple, uh, plus an extra 500 bucks per dependent, um, you're too rich for ODSP, but there are many exempt assets that don't count towards the asset limits. So like a house, a car, an RDSP, like if you have some money in a trust that can be exempt. So um, I would look at the policy directives if you're in doubt. Because if people if people like look at $50,000 and they're like, oh no, I have a house, I have a car, like no way. Um, you actually might still be under the limit. Um, let's get the income limits. Let's get the income. Well, actually I will say if you do work on ODSP, they claw back a certain amount. So right now it's, you can earn $200 uh, a month in employment or self-employment income, and they don't touch it. Then after that, they claw it at 50%. And basically when you get, when the clawbacks are more than your ODSP, you know, amount, you get an income support, then you're deemed financially ineligible. And like, making too much money to be on ODSP. Um, I understand that the government just announced that they're changing the numbers. So I think now it's gonna be like, a, you can earn $1,000 a month without any clawbacks. Uh, but I don't think that's made its way through the legislature yet. And rapid reinstatement. So if you were on ODSP and got kicked off because you got too rich, um, you can be rapidly reinstated if your income goes back down. So yeah, you, you don't necessarily need to prove you're disabled again. Um, yeah, in, in, unless in some case there was like a medical review date, we'll talk about that quickly later. That complicates things a bit. Okay, um, quickly some benefits that ODSP gives. Um, 
So there's mandatory special necessities. So that covers a bunch of medical supplies and medical transportation. So if you have regular doctor's trips, um, they can cover you know transit or in some cases taxis if they in some cases um, like diabetic supplies, different medical supplies. Um, you can get a top up to $250 a month if you have special dietary needs, special dietary needs. Uh, the doctor needs to fill out a form. And they have like a list of conditions. Actually, I didn't check if there was any cancer-related special diet allowance ones, but I'm guessing there's there might be. Um, if you have a guide dog, um, get an extra 84 bucks a month, but they want specific, you know, proof that it's a real guide dog. Um, and they also help cover like some vision, some dental, some assistive devices, hearing aids, prescription drugs through the Ontario drug formulary, and there are like some other benefits. So um, yeah, and there's a couple of different ways if you are getting off ODSP because of either employment or other getting too much income that you can keep the benefits. So like the drugs and the, the other stuff. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. So there's transitional health, sorry, transitional health benefits. If you basically are an ODSP and then you leave because you're working again and making more money, um, in some cases you can still keep the benefits. And there's extended health benefits in some cases. Um, I think the biggest group is recipients who cease to be eligible for ODSP income support because of excess income but have high health costs. They do a whole calculation. Uh, it's a specific thing. I can't give you like the exact numbers. But uh, yeah, but like, we see that often with people who like are on ODSP, turn 65, get their Canada pension plan, retirement, and like old age security. So they're making more than ODSP pays, so they're financially ineligible. Um, but then, um, yes, have high health costs. They can do the extended health benefits and keep the ODSP benefits into retirement. Oh yes, and medical reviews. This part is super important. Um, so ODSP, um, in some cases they put people on ODSP forever uh, and then that's great. It's just straightforward. Um, in many cases, especially when they think that there's a chance of improvement. Um, and in particular with like relatively younger people. Um, and I expect a lot of cancer survivors to fall in this category. Um, they do what's called, a, they set a medical review date. Um, so basically it can be, I think if it's, it, it's between one and five years. I think if it's ODSP, that gives the medical review date, it has to be either two or five years. But if it goes to the tribunal, I think they're not, it can be anything between one and five. Um, may be wrong about the exact numbers, but basically what you need to remember is that you may be put on ODSP for a limited amount of time, that is five years or less, in which case uh, when the medical review comes up, um, your healthcare professional must complete a medical review form. And basically, if they say that everything stayed the same and that it's all expected to last one year or more, then you get put back on. Um, if you had some improvement or some changes, it can be a bit more complicated, but you can still get put back on. I'd recommend going to a legal aid clinic for assistance with these, though. Because sometimes um, doctors can really, um, if not used to doing these, complicate life for their patients if they improperly fill these out. I'm dealing with one of those cases right now and it's, it's very annoying. Questions? Wow, what an incredible, um, what an incredible presentation. There's a lot of information in 45 minutes. Um, in many ways, it seems like drinking out of a fire hose. I'm sure for a lot of our um, for a lot of our attendees and our clients. Um, so yeah, like like Daniel said, um, if you have any questions, please feel free to drop them into the comments 
or into the uh, question section at the bottom right of your screen. We do have one here. Um, it's it's uh, they just ask: Is this specific to Ontario? Is there a similar program in Alberta? The, yes. So ODSP uh, is the Ontario Disability Support Program. It is particular. Yeah, it's specific to Ontario. I have no idea what they have in uh, Alberta. Like it's weird. Um, it used to be Ontario, I think, up until about 1997. This didn't exist, and there was just like welfare. Um, but then they slashed the government slashed the welfare rates. Um, but then people were saying like, well, just really uh, messing with like a lot of like people with disabilities. Like this is not cool. So then the government was all like, okay. And they split Ontario Works uh, from ODSP. So then people on Ontario Works uh, got a lot less money and people on ODSP got relatively more money, though still poverty um, income and like better benefits. Um, so it's like a weird thing of history that we even have ODSP, I think. Okay. So I don't know what it's like in Alberta. Okay. The answer. Um, there are, I, I would say, or I would pose another question to you, like there are legal clinics like yours across the country, right? Where, uh, at, at kind of, no? Maybe, um, I'm extremely Ontario focused, I'm very sorry. Um, what I will say is, so we're run by Legal Aid Ontario, um, which covers, well, Ontario. Um, I know like the, uh, from what I understand is like the Legal Aid Ontario system is like the most generous and developed legal aid system in the world. Um, which is troubling because it's really underfunded. Um, but um, yeah, I don't know what the landscape is in Alberta or like the rest of the country. I know there is like different legal aid schemes in the rest of the country, but I don't know how they compare or if they have like the same network of like community clinics and if they do the same areas of law. Um, a lot of what legal aid does, it's um, probably like what gets the most of the budget, at least in Ontario. It's like criminal law and family law, um, where they basically give criminal and family lawyers, they basically pay them to help people who are low income. Um, and like the stuff that the community clinics do is sort of like an afterthought um, to that part of the legal aid system. So like for sure, like the country definitely has, or like I don't want to say definitely, but almost certainly has like some legal aid stuff for criminal law um but for like this kind of law i'm a lot less certain i understand okay. bc has some pretty good stuff but i don't know sorry okay um no that's that's great i think one of the one of the biggest takeaways for me from uh, both your webinar and, and last week's webinar is um having having people on your team right or, or looking for people on your team and i think if you're in an area of the country outside of Ontario, um, you know, the probably the best thing you could do is, is do a Google search for um, community legal aid, um, ways that, that you can find legal professionals and other medical professionals to come alongside you and help you along this journey to find resources in your area um, that can be specific to you, right? Absolutely, and that makes all the difference. Um, and this is just general because like, any of these like legal programs, like I know like CPP Disability, that's a national one. Um, they have like very specific requirements that, you know, when you look at the form, or you look at the website, you may think, oh, this looks really straightforward. Um, but they're, they're often not. Um, so yes, whatever it is, you want to reach out to people who know what it's actually like um, and who know like how to get on. Yeah, for sure. I've got a comment here that just came in. It says, please get information from other provinces. Um, otherwise, designating the organization as Canadian Cancer Survivor Network is misleading. I do I do just need to, to present a, a bit of a caveat that these, like we said, uh, this one and last week's webinar are very um, Ontario-centric, as you can tell. We are working on getting presenters in the new year that will cover other areas of the country. Um, so we're looking at uh, speakers in Alberta and BC, as well as the Maritimes. I think 
um, if I'm not mistaken, the Maritimes as a whole, kind of the, the four provinces function together a lot more. And so um, there's there's just some um, intricacies about you know being a national organization when a lot of these things are provincially funded. So so please, uh, we I thank you for that comment, and I we are already thinking of it. We'll have more information on on other provincial specific. Um, webinars coming out shortly as soon as we we book our speakers so if there are any other questions i would love to i'd love to take them now um, if not i just want to thank you so much for attending our webinar tonight um, ccsn would like to thank daniel bastian for uh, an incredibly informative and insightful presentation and for all the work that you do um, at your uh, neighborhood legal clinic um, this is the third in a series of webinars we're calling Cancer Survivor to Financial Survivor. Um, and registration information for our next webinars will be out soon. So watch your inboxes for that and social media feeds as well. Uh, just a quick note about email. Um, if you're not seeing our emails in your inbox, please check your spam or junk mail folders. We use a third party email service. So check your spam folders and mark emails from CCSN as safe or add us to your contacts list uh, to ensure they'll come straight to your inbox. Um, okay, so I've got I've got another question here before I finally, finally close off with my uh, with my spiel here. Um, there, the question here is often client patients may in fact need assistance to complete the documentation. Um, to what extent is this feasible? It's totally allowed. Um, there's even a box to tick uh, on the forms that say, you know, um, somebody helps you complete the form. And then they ask why. And then you have a chance to say, because I'm disabled or like, because I have a hard time concentrating or whatever. Um, so that's good. And, um, and to be clear, most of the form, it's really the doctor's like, or the healthcare provider's job to fill it out. Um, like all the mandatory parts, uh, it's supposed to be done by the doctor. Um, and then the part that the patient fills out is like optional. So technically okay. you don't really need to do anything. All I'd recommend talking to your doctor. Right. Of course. That's great. Um, well, again, just thank you so much to Daniel and for you to, for attending, um, and as always, all of our previous webinars are accessible on demand and through our website at survivornet.ca slash webinars. Um, just thank you again for joining and watch out for um, Western specific provinces and Eastern specific provinces as we'll be having uh, s webinars focused on, on these provinces as well with this kind of incredible information. Um, but again, just, just kind of a last minute thing or, or uh, one last thing really look for people who are on your side who are gonna help you. Um, that's the entire reason why we're putting this webinar series together is to help put financial resources together and put them in your hands and make them easily accessible. Um, and just to give encouragement for you to advocate for yourself um, and, and have people around you that, that want to see you succeed and, and, um, and have a long and healthy life after cancer. And so, yeah. Thank you so much again to everyone for attending and we'll see you next week. And thank you all for having me with you. <laughs>